Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Lunch, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope you're all safe and sound, ensconced in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to welcoming you back to the Yacht Club just as soon as it's safe for you to come. Today, another one of our online interviews, we'll be talking to folks on both coasts uh, on a really, really exciting subject with a great piece of news to share uh, during. And there is, there is no one-sided story here. There's good news and there's sad news. We hope it won't be long sad news, but there's both. Uh, first, our first guest speaker is Michelle Larkamp, who began sailing as a youngster at, say, at seven years <coughs> age, sailing Opti's in American Yacht Club. Those of you who sailed in Long Island Sound, that American is a wonderful, prestigious, and beautiful um, Yacht Club on Long Island Sound. Uh, she sailed in the South Americans at age 14 in Salinas, Ecuador, and by age 17 won the U.S. Youth Champions in International 420s. At 17, she also took fourth in the International 420 Worlds, and here at the ripe age of 19, she is the Woman Intercollegiate Sailor of the Year. Congratulations, Michelle. Also as a guest on today's show, Jack Parkin. Jack came from a sailing family and was sailing on uh, incredibly cool rides. If you ever sailed on an a Flying 15 in England, very cool ride. Uh, kind of like an International 14, but a little different. Uh, anyway, at age five, he won his first mirror regatta on the Solon. At age nine, uh, the first, first in the Nationals in the FIVA class in England. At age 17, first in the U.S. Youth uh, championships international 420 class in um, Auckland at 21 won the college uh, match racing national championship representing Stanford and the Stanford team skipping the Stanford team and at 21 Jack Parkin is intercollegiate sailor of the year wonderful and congratulations Jack and also a guest on our show Jaron Lee Jaron Lee started sailing wooden boats schooners they were back in the aught years in Maine uh, in 1965, he was part of the U-2 program for the Department of Defense, and after graduating from Stanford, started sailing one design in San Francisco Bay with Ericsson 27s and then Ericsson 37s, and hit the big time at San Francisco Bay in the 80s, and the rest of us got to know him because he was the owner and skipper of the famous IOR boat, Irrational, which sailed in the Big Boat Series and was on the American team in the Clipper. He is also, and very significantly for our discussions today, one of the leading, if not the leading, proponent of the Stanford Sailing Team and the alum. And Michelle, if you'll give us a nice image to talk about from the Stanford Sailing Program. Now, this is not only the first time that the Stanford Sailing Team has placed in the intercollegiate camps, but you swept it. You won both the men's and the women's intercollegiate champs. So, Jaron Lee, when did Stanford start having a sailing team? Stanford has had an active inter intercollegiate sailing team since uh, approximately 1948. Wonderful. And uh, when did you graduate from Stanford? 1959. Jack, what year were you born? I was born in 1998. <laughs> so Jared, Jared had been sailing for a long time when the intercollegiate Sailor of the Year was born. Jack Parkin, Intercollegiate Sailor of the Year. Uh, tell us, in a typical sailing year, how many regattas would Stanford participate in? So in a typical year, the, uh, the Stanford Sailing Team would roughly compete in 10 regattas. And what's a format for a typical regatta? What day does it start, what day does it end, and how many races? So typically, it's a um, Saturday-Sunday affair um, with... Uh, 18 boats on the water from 18 different schools, and we complete 18 races in those two days. And um, what's the typical boat that you're racing in? So these days, we usually sail uh, 420s and uh, FJs. When do you sail a 420 versus an FJ? Was there a different occasion for each? Yeah, so usually um, there's two, uh, two boats from each school, an A and B division. And one day you'll sail for 20s, and then the next day you'll sail FJs. Michelle Larkham, uh, intercollegiate 
Woman Sailor of the Year. Um, this year was a tough year. Uh, there were fewer regattas this year, so you had to do even better in those fewer regattas. How many regattas were there this year? Um, we only had a fall season this year, so um, I think there were roughly like six regattas we went to um, for the women's team. So uh, is there single-handed sailing and double-handed sailing? What's the format, Michelle? Yes, so we do have a single-handed team, um, just about for like four or five that sail on the single-handed circuit. Um, and there's also double-handed that our whole team participates in. Um, single-handed would have our PCC's championship and then nationals, so not a lot of events. Um, but double-handed, we have almost every weekend. And what kind of boat is the single-handed sailor? And a laser. I do not participate in the um, single-handed. I only sail double-handed. Jack, which do you like better, double-handed or single? I uh, I also only sail in the uh, double-handed, um, but I do the match racing, which is, you know, three or four people. Mm -hmm. So when you go on a regatta, Michelle, do you have uh, some fleet races and some match races and some team racing? What's, what about those other formats of racing? Um, in the fall, we primarily uh, do fleet racing. Um, and then there's some match racing and also single-handed. And then in the spring, there's more team racing um, in addition to some fleet race regattas. So in the, this past fall, um, I only competed in fleet races. So which are the toughest schools for you, Michelle? Where are the women sailors the toughest? Um, there are absolutely so many amazing female sailors in the circuit, um, but some really awesome female sailors are from Brown, Yale, Dartmouth, um, and that whole Ivy League has a very strong circuit of female sailors. Um, yeah. So Jaren, um, your co-founder, along with yours truly, of the big sale, the Cal Stanford competition that's been going on for 17 years. And that's one kind of fundraising event. But otherwise, how does the sailing team get funded? Has it been funded all these years? By the school? Tell me about that. Yes, it's been funded by the athletic department. The sailing team is part of the athletic department. And so now, even though Stanford has just won the Intercollegiate Male Man Sailor of the Year and Intercollegiate Woman Sailor of the Year. We are all four of us in receipt of the most startling news in the last matter of days. And um, Jack, tell us what that news was about the Stanford Sailing Team. Yeah, so within the last couple of days, we unfortunately heard that uh, along with 10 other sports, we are gonna be uh, demoted from a varsity level to a, a club sport starting in the uh, academic year of 2022. 2022. So what will that mean for sailing as an activity? How will that affect how many regattas you go to or what kind of regattas you go to, etc.? Well, to be honest, our future is pretty unknown at the moment. We know that there is a really strong alumni support, um, but with the lack of the varsity um, like caliber and level, um, that means reduced funding, which is going to be certainly an impact given that many of our regattas are on the East Coast. We, so, Michelle, give me a travel schedule. If you're going to go to a regatta at Brown, first, where will you sail? And when would you leave the Bay Area? And when would you come back? Yeah, so usually we have a Friday morning flight. Um, we'll arrive on the East Coast Friday afternoon or late evening. Um, and then we will start racing at the venue um, Saturday morning. Um, so that would include two nights at a hotel um, and then provided food. Or actually, we would go to the grocery store and get food. Um, but some big costs are flight costs because we travel across and back and um, hotel expenses. And so... Um what time do you get back on Sunday or Monday? Um, we usually always arrive um, really, really late at night on Sunday night. Um, I think the latest I've arrived back on campus was 1.30 a.m. 
um, on Monday morning. Um, but we try and get there like by the airport by m- midnight or 11 p.m. So, Jack, Saturday, first day of a regatta, what time are you on the water? So typical regattas start roughly between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning is the report time. That's, that's dock start. That's be at, the do- be at the boats? Be at the boats. And what time do you leave the dock on Sunday? Well, it depends on what conference you're in, but typically it's between 3 and 4 p.m. Now, one would imagine that with this travel time and the distances, and all the other activities engaged in getting a boat in the water, that it's got to be a very time-consuming sport. And yet, I already know that the scholastic level of participants in sailing is not bad. What's your GPA, Michelle? Um, so as a freshman, um, I have a 3.97 GPA, um, which is... Pretty good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Jack, what about your GPA? Um, I actually don't know off my hand, but I think it's pretty good. So I happen to know that collegiate GPAs among uh, academic GPAs among collegiate sailors is is very high and very good. And so I'm all the more disappointed by the sad news, which I can't spend any more time on, uh, about Stanford not having a sailing program. So, uh, Jaron, where were you when you heard that the Stanford sailing program you, the supporter, significant alumni supporter, where were you when you heard it had been canceled? I opened uh, my computer about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning at my desk and uh, saw the, uh, the letter from Stanford and opened it first. And there went my day. <laughs> Amazing. Let's hope we get through this COVID thing. Let's hope we get uh, um, other initiatives behind us and we can get back to, 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 uh, to the good part about racing. So, um, Jack, who are the toughest competitors in intercollegiate sailing from a man's perspective? Well, I have to say that there is many different schools that have you know, very good sailors. Um, I know that my fellow finalist for College Sailor of the Year was from Georgetown, and they have a phenomenal team. Um, you know, other great schools are Yale, Charleston, the Ivies, as Michelle said. And one thing you'll find is that many of the schools with great women sailors have also great co-ed sailors. So talk to me about uh, venues. Uh, give me some examples of what you consider to be difficult venues, Michelle. Yes. Um, so I had two, my first two regattas were at the same venue, which was Connecticut College. And it was sailed on the river. And it was very tough very challenging for sure um constantly changing a lot of geographic features um, and there were some days where the breeze would just shift 180 degrees in the middle of a race and we would have to restart um so current is big factor on rivers um shifts geographical features a lot of variables always constantly changing so had you gotten a weather briefing or anything what kind of briefing do you get jack before we got a what kind of briefing do you typically get about the conditions, the venue, the wind, etc.? Well, as a team, we usually talk about what kind of day we're going to be sailing in. Um, usually, you know, it's, it depends on the venue a lot. Um, but college sailing is so variable that often you might talk about one thing for, before you go sailing, but by the time you're on the water, it's already changed. So it's all about being adaptive. What do you like better personally if you, if you knew that you were having to bet the house on a race? What wind condition in, in the 420 and what wave, what sea state would you want to compete in to optimize your own performance? Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the middle road. Just anything medium winds because, you know, you have the option for light spots and for windier spots. And then... You know, big waves are always fun, but also flat water is also great. So I'm up for anything. Um, Michelle, give me your, your perfect, who was ra- your race, counting on a big, big bet on this race. What wind condition and sea state do you like? Um, I'm more of a performer to like the lighter medium as well. Um, to say like 10 to 15 knots is nice. Um, flat water. 
And yeah, I'm up for game for anything. So Jaron, talk about the sailing uh, clubhouse down in, uh, you know, east of the Stanford campus. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yes, uh, the sailing shares the clubhouse with the crew teams. I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Um, it's a modern building, uh, good docks, a large number of sails, a large number of uh, sailboats, as well as uh, full crew equipment. And there's been a paid staff on the sailing team. Can you describe the, the, how the, many folks? The sailing team has a paid coach. Um, that uh, he has an assistant and uh, a, 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 a younger uh, person who's uh, part boat boy and uh, does whatever is needed. That's the professional team. So physical training, sailors. Talk to me at all about um, physical training, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Female sailor. Um, so we have lift team lifts two times a week. Um, this past year we had them Tuesdays and Thursdays um, at 7 a.m. And we also have a team, we had some team uh, runs that were awesome. And that's pretty much it, but staying healthy and eating well. When you did lifts, what would you lift? Would you be, these be curls, bench press? What kind of, what kind of lifts would you do? Yeah. Um, so first we stretch, which is really important. Um, we use foam rollers a lot to make sure we're ready to lift. Um, a lot of squats, a lot of core, um, not a lot of bench presses, not a lot of curls, um, pretty much a full body workout, um, a little bit lighter on weights, but you could choose how much you would want to lift. Um, and yeah, a lot of body weight as well that we used. How many reps? Um, we would do three rounds and it would be around 10 reps. 10 reps and then you change and do another 10 reps and then 10 reps. Jack, what about you? Physical weight? Oh, on the running, how long would you run, Michelle? Um, I think it was, we were trying to do like a time wise, like we would run for 45 minutes at your own pace or with a teammate that's a similar pace, um, which was more of a team bonding, but also really way to Keep up your endurance. Were you listening to music as you ran? Yes, and we tried to also talk during our run, but that's challenging. Okay, Jack, uh, what about weight training for you, or what physical training? Yeah, it's uh, much of the same. Uh, good, uh, like, core exercise, uh, a lot of aerobic, um, which is great, because for sailing, it's pretty handy to be uh, slim, so you know, obviously running it a lot helps. So what, uh, give me your, give me your workout, give me your physical training workout. How many reps? How long? Yeah, I mean, it's, we, uh, we all do the same. The, the men and the women all work out together. It's a great team bonding exercise, you know, there bright and early, um, Tuesdays, Thursdays. And uh, we have a professional, um, you know, physical coach. Um, and, you know, they basically design the whole lift for us. It's really great. So give me the day in the life of a student at Stanford who's on the sailing team. Uh, Michelle, give me a, what time you wake up, you know, not counting regatta days. We're talking Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. um, so one Monday, Wednesdays, and then sometimes Fridays. Um, I usually had a 9 a.m. class. So I'd get up at around 8, um, get ready, and go to class. And then our team vans left around, it changed during the year, but usually around um, like two. And then we would go to the boathouse, um, rig up, sail. And then we'd get back on campus, sometimes as late as seven. And I'd do homework and then um, eat dinner real quick and then go to office hours if there was time. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays, it will be a lot earlier um, because of Lyft. So we would, I'd get up at 6.30 and then go to Lyft at seven. And then we were usually done by eight 
15 or an 810 lift. And then we'd all sometimes have um, breakfast together as a team, which was really nice. Um, at the cafe called Jimmy B's. They have great breakfast burritos. I highly recommend. And then I would have a class. So then I would do some work in, in between. And then we'd also head to, out to the boathouse. Um, sometimes a little earlier on those days, um, around like one thirty or 1. So what time, do you, what time do you go to sleep in that typical day? I try to be asleep by... 11, 11.30. Jack, how close is that to what your, your time? How would you vary? Yeah, very, very similar. Um, you know, the whole sailing team pretty much runs the same schedule. Um, and you certainly need to go to bed early before those 6.30 wake-ups for a lift. <laughs> so give me a funny episode in the regatta, Jack. Uh, either in a, First of all, you're, you're in team racing a lot these days. That's a, that's a cool activity that started in collegiate sailing, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. So what about you? In, uh, give me a funny episode in, in a team race. And for those who don't know, Jaron, tell people what a team race is. Um, a team okay, race a is team. a full, fully crewed boat uh, supplied by the Yacht Club generally. Um, where the race is taking place. Um, St. Francis has uh, J-20s, and uh, you have 10 of them. The crews assemble, uh, have very little time to practice, they have to put together the boat, go out and get ready for the first race. Um, they are not racing mano a mano, but they're racing the other team, which may consist of, of let's say, three boats. Could be different, um, and they're out on the water, um, and you try to pair up, and uh, uh, you try to spring one of your boats free, let them get around the mark first, and uh, you're fully free within the rules of uh, blocking and slowing down the other team. Uh, it sounds simple, and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, give me a funny – I started to ask Jack earlier. Jack, give me a funny story about in team racing. Can you tell me a funny occurrence when something unusual happened? Team racing is a very interesting uh, sport. Um, sometimes when you have two teammates maybe ahead – then as the third teammate, it is your sole responsibility to do everything to slow down the other boats. That means you can do some pretty, uh, some pretty wild maneuvers that you, you would never do in a fleet race. Um, and it, it's called the wrecking ball because it doesn't matter what happens to you as long as you just cause damage. Not, not damage in the sense of boat damage, but, you know, slowing the other team. <laughs> Michelle, give me a slow and give me give me a wild thing you've done in a, in a team race to slow another boat. We had some really fun team race practices, um, and our coach would sail um, with us actually. Um, so Nick would Nick tell us and I would sail against Jack, Wiley, and uh, Jacob, and those team races were very intense. Um, I remember actually Jack and Jacob would gang up on me, and I felt very intimidated. Um, <laughs> But it would, they really pushed us, and I'm so excited to just get back on the, the water and them to keep on pushing me and keep on ganging up on me. <laughs> so, so, Jack, what can you do to slow a boat down? Um, to slow a boat down, you mainly need to stay upwind of them. You um, need to uh, basically between basically the wind and them. Um, and to, do, to make it hurt extra more, you can trim your sails. You can over-trim your sails. And that creates like even more drag than say you were covering someone. Um, and that's actually the most effective way to slow someone down. Over trim your sails so there's more turbulence around your foils and that's turbulence behind you. Exactly. Yeah. You'd be surprised if you can pull as hard as you can, you do a lot of turbulence and you slow them down a lot. And so Jaren, you actually raced in team races in the ocean. The Clipper Cup was a kind of a team race. It's going to be measured how everybody did, uh, your, the, the U.S. team, etc. I remember 
No, it, it was it was great fun. Uh, a little different with uh, forty foot boats. <laughs> right, we know that. So, Michelle, um, wh when you talk about the difference between what does a coach do for you in sailing, give me some some uh, coaching moments. Uh, you know, there, you, everybody knows that sailing is a sport where you can learn all about math without even opening a book about math. And you keep learning about angles and trigonometry and the weather by actually being out on the water. So uh, tell me tell me something that coaches have, have helped you with as a sailor. Um, so our coaching staff is incredible. Um, so Brian Swingley is our head coach. Chris Clavin is our assistant coach. And so is Nick Baird. And I got the pleasure to sail with uh, Chris in my boat, actually. He'd be crewing for me. And um, he teached me the smallest um, adjustments as a skipper. Um, which was super helpful. Um, but I think a really big part of it is them as mentors um, at regattas, but also during practice. Um, they keep our team focused and um, efficient at all times. And uh, they also push us out on the water, but then also make sure we're doing fine like edu with our education and balancing schoolwork and also sailing. Um, but I think the, one of the biggest things is um, at regattas, um, they have an even keel when we switch and rotate boats. Um, they give us feedback, but also just make sure that we're doing well mentally and we're still in the game and we don't get distracted, which I think is really, really helpful. So now, Jack, you've been crew and skipper, but you've mostly been skipper. Is that the case? For many years before college, I was crewing with um, a fellow, one of my teammates, Wiley Rogers. Uh, but now in college, uh, I skipper mostly. Mm -hmm. And talk to me about, um, about physically what you do on a 420. Talk about the hiking side of it first, and then talk to me about you know, making a 420 go fast. So what do you have to say about hiking? The 420 is very much a hiking boat um, in the sense that you really need to uh, – you know, create a lot of leverage. And uh, that's one of the main reasons that we do a lot of the workouts, you know, doing the squats in the gym certainly help when it comes to hiking. Um, and the flatter you can keep the boat, the faster you're going to go. So um, talk to me about, about uh, skippering 420s. What's different about a 420 versus a performance dinghy? Talk to me about any differences. So there's many different variants of 420s. In college, we have very simple ones. So the simplest way to say it is there's probably only three or four ropes you can adjust on a 420 in college compared to a high-performance boat where you can make, maybe change 20 things. So there's less things to change and more things to just focus on the racing rather than the technical aspect. Mm -hmm. And so when you're sailing the 420, how many steps across the cockpit for you as a skipper? in a jug of a 420. Yeah, so basically in any maneuver, you want to minimize the amount of things you do and you want to be able to do it as fast and as fluid as possible. Um, so in that sense, if you look at jiving in college sailing, it's pretty athletic in the sense that, you know, you wait, you communicate with your crew and then you basically initiate the roll. So you basically put your boat at a 45 degree angle, sometimes more. Um, you throw yourself over the side, get your... You mean healing wise. Right, so you're going like this, you heal your boat, so with your, with your body weight, so you often get... Heal your boat to leeward, heal your boat to leeward. Yep, heal your boat to leeward, um, and then you cross the boat, so you, now you're on port, going downwind, and you flatten the boat. And that crossing of the boat is pretty athletic, because you're going from basically hanging over the side, wet in the water, on to the up starboard the side. On the starboard side. Right, on the starboard side, up onto the port side, in half a second. So, um, and one of the major roles of being a crew in college sailing is good timing with your skipper, making sure that you're exactly in sync and also being extremely fluid in the front. How many, have you got it in your head? How many steps across the cockpit if you're, if you're a skipper on a jive? Um, probably two. I try to, I'm trying to make it one. <laughs> Shorter. <laughs> Right, right. As you may know, uh, our guest a few weeks ago was the eight-time world champion, Mike Martin and Adam Lowry. 
in uh, 505 planing skiffs with a trapeze. And uh, Mike, try, try, when he does it right, he says he can skip her across in a jive in one step. And um, the crew, who's got a spinnaker pole to take down, a spinnaker pole to put out, a jib and a spinnaker to handle, he gets across in three steps. As they both said, when it works right. <laughs> Um, so, so Jack, when you're not sailing um, collegiately, what other sailing do you do? So in recent years, I've been pretty active on the uh, youth match race circuit. Um, for example, right before the whole coronavirus, I was in Auckland in February for the, uh, the youth match race worlds, um, which went great. We, we, kept, we were runner up, we got second. Um, and that was a, with a mostly Stanford team. So that was fantastic. Who, uh, who won that? So an Australian team did from, I believe, the Cruising Yachts Club of Australia. Michelle, when you're not racing at, when you're not sailing Stanford, collegiate sailing, what kind of sailing do you do? Um, I'm trying to get into some more big boats. Um, my dad has a 46 Daler. Um, and uh, we were supposed to go on the Bermuda race this past um, June, but that didn't happen due to coronavirus. Um, but I've also gone a little bit into J70s, which is a lot of fun. Um, so trying to get into that little area. Have you read any books about sailing? If so, what do you like? Um, I think Jack can hop out on this one. Um, but I've read Windcheck, and also Dave Perry has an awesome collection of books he's written. written. Uh -huh. Yeah, books, sailing. Yeah, Winning in One Designs by Dave Perry. It's a, it's a great book. I actually had the pleasure of being coached by him in, uh, in Auckland, which was fantastic. Uh -huh. Great. What about movies, Jack? Sailing movies? Sailing movies. Um, that's a tough one, actually. But uh, I recently watched the sailing movie about the... Um, the uh, around the way uh, around the world race, which was an all female crew, fantastic movie. Would make it, made it, made it. Yeah, we did a Wednesday yachting luncheon with them last like November when they came to California. They stayed. We had a dinner for them, so it was not a Wednesday yachting lunch. It was a Wednesday yachting dinner. Yeah, that was a very fun story. So Michelle, who's inspiring for you in sailing? I know that's a glorious word, inspiration. But do you get any inspiration from other sailors? Who inspires you? Yeah, um, there's a lot of people that inspire me. Um, a lot of female sailors that I look up to. Um, a lot of people I competed against, actually, um, this past season, which is really cool. Um, I think the SCA team that did the Volvo Ocean Race really inspire me. Um, a lot of females that are sailing co-ed, like Maya um, and Ragna and Audrey Giblin and Emily Haig, they all sailed co-ed, which was awesome. Um, and I've always had inspirations and this, my teammates are a really big one. Um, they push me on the water. They're there for me off the water. Um, and they help me with every corner of life, um, whether it be schoolwork, friendships, um, relationships even. <laughs> um, and just even sailing. Um, yeah, I think my teammates truly do inspire me. Jack, sailing heroes. Yeah, I think two big ones for me are my parents. Um, my, uh, my mom went to the Olympics uh, three times. My dad went twice um, for GBR um, in the 470 and in the sailing respectively. And, you know, they've just been great inspirations. How they balance sailing with everything else in life. Um, I also got to say my team is, you know, they, we push each other every day um, and, you know, so much respect for each other. And it's like, you know, someone beats you in practice. You say, wow, great, great job. Good for you. And I'll get you next time. Jaron Lee, lifelong sailor, Stanford sailing uh, supporter, sailing heroes. Who were your sailing heroes? There were four, but two of them have died. John Bertrand and Paul Kayard both sailed with me when they were 16. Um, Bob Billingham, I sponsored it. Mark Rudiger. Right, great. 
Mark uh, navigated Paul Kayard's victory around the world on short notice. Right. Great guy. Great guy. Great guy. Real quick, I just yeah. want to say, you know, in the coming years, Stanford Sailing, if you're alumni or you have interest, we're going to need your help a lot. Um, you know, we're going to have great alumni regattas and events, and we know that your support means a lot. So, Michelle, um, what do you have to say about the, the, the media decision uh, to stop funding? Where were you when you heard the news? I was actually at work. Um, I'm working at a local yacht club called Largemont Yacht Club. Um, and my teammate was sobbing on the phone when she called me, and I hadn't heard the news yet. Um, and then I saw the email um, during my lunch break and sat on the dock at Large Mon Yacht Club and just, I didn't even know what to think. Um, I kind of broke down. Um, didn't know what that meant for our team, um, considering this was my first year at Stanford. Um, I only had one season. Um, and I still have three more years of college sailing and I still love sailing and love college sailing. And I don't, Stanford can never take that away from us. Um, but I think our team really needs support from our alumni, from anybody that's interested. Um, and we're going to become stronger together. Um, we rely on each other. We're a big family and that will never go away. Jack, where were you when you got the news that Stanford was going to discontinue the sailing team, one among 11 other sports, I think, were that discontinued? Yeah, on, uh, unfortunately, I was on a, on a work call when I found out. Um, and, you know, just starting to try and, you know, doing an internship these days, trying to remain professional, but uh, definitely very difficult day. Um, very sad and, you know, just really tough. And for me, it's, you know, I'm one of the old guys, so I'm getting past, like, I'm leaving soon. But uh, for, you know, the freshman like Michelle, um, the incoming freshman, you know, I feel particularly bad. And also our coach who, you know, who knows what's going to happen with their job going forwards. Um, you know, fingers crossed, but I, I can see the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I know that we're going to do great things going forwards. If the best of all possible worlds happened with Stanford Sailing, Jack, what would you imagine that to be? I think the best thing, you know, for Stanford Sailing looking forward is like just a really strong program where, you know, we have everything we need and, you know, we have the great sailors. Um, we just need the support and just the basically the backing to go to the regattas and go win regattas and win nationals. So are you imagining that it would be possible to have travel expenses covered and maybe a smaller coaching staff to get the overall cost. I understand the overall cost is around, this is unofficial, around three quarters of a million dollars a year. And so uh, are you thinking one possibility might be to wish for travel expenses covered and just one person on the staff? Yeah, I truly don't know what the actual number is. Um, that could be accurate, sounds pretty high, but uh, uh, you know, yeah, I think, we just, we're a small team. We need, you know, obviously someone, a coach to rely on. Um, and we have great competition out here on the West Coast. But at the end of the day, all the big regattas, you know, the big key ones, you know, three times a year are uh, out on the uh, East Coast. And you can't walk there. <laughs> Michelle, what, what would you wish could happen uh, now that the news that, Stanford sailing is one of 11 sports Stanford's going to discontinue. What would you wish could happen that could possibly allow you to keep racing? We definitely need a really strong alumni and supporting network um, to allow us to compete at East Coast Regattas, like Jack was saying. Um, I think our team, we have a boathouse, we have boats, we don't need any, any equipment. Um, it's just about the flight costs and our coaching staff that's really, really important right now. Um, and I think our team we'll figure out the rest and the smaller details, but really big thing is keeping our head coach at the moment and um, creating a, or we're going to try and have a really smooth transit transition into a club sport. Um, but we'll still be winning regattas and still going to compete at national championships regardless. So Jack, the potential of an endowment, um, 
you mentioned to me previously that the rugby team has a big endowment. Could you tell me something about what you know about the rug Stanford rugby team? Sure. So Stanford rugby team is a, a club sport, um, but their current endowment is larger than the football teams, um, excluding scholarships. And, you know, I think, I think we have an endowment in place or, you know, in the future, we should really plan on having a sailing team endowment. Um, and, you know, I think it'd be great to break that record, to be honest. Jack, I don't believe uh, the sailing team has an endowment. Uh, John Vandemore and I and uh, Scott Sellers and Robert Brown, who we were the three guys who kind of got it going uh, back in the late 90s. Um, and, and we've talked about it. And we've also talked about um, getting a, um, an endowment for the sailing coach. Boy, I wish we had that now because that would mean the sailing coach was paid for by so, the endowment. As a Stanford alumni and big supporter of Stanford sailing, um, um, might it be possible that we could consider creating a endowment for the sailing team at Stanford? Is that a possibility? Absolutely, absolutely. I I think yeah. Fortunately, as Jack mentioned, we have a year. We'll need every second of that year. If somebody was interested in helping alumni and others who might want to help and consider some possible way that we could support the Sanford sailing team, would it be okay if we had them contact unofficially Jaron Lee? Give us your email address, Jaron. Absolutely, Ron. My email address is my name. Jaren, J-A-R-E-N dot Leet, L-E-E-T at email dot com. My cell phone is 510-504-4828. So as a co-founder with you of The Big Sale, we once dreamed of something that hadn't happened before. And we created this regatta right next to the venue in front of St. Francis Yacht Club where we get a full house of several hundred alumni every year who come and watch. And you and I both went out and raised small money, 12,000 bucks or so to get sales with colors on them a couple of years ago with fundraising activities. So I don't want to think that it's impossible to consider the unthinkable with regard to potentially helping the uh, Stanford sailing team. And I want those who watch the video to realize that this is an incredible program. You couldn't have better performance than to have the Collegiate Female Sailor of the Year and the Collegiate Sailor of the Year, both from Stanford, a sweep of the category in a year when the Stanford has basically discontinued thereafter the program. So we want to wish the very best for your sailing program, Jack and Michelle. And I know that you couldn't have a better champion in Jaron and others who we may be able to muster with news uh, of, your, of this uh, activity. Uh, through the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you very much for being our guest. You're terrific sailors and terrific guests at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And with that, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon is adjourned. Thank you. Good going, guys. <laughs>